we've been studying the basics of rightly dividing the word of truth and we were looking at daniel the book of daniel because jesus christ in relation to the end of the world instructed them to look at daniel the prophet daniel concerning the end of the world the great tribulation and when the abomination which make it desolate stands in the holy place obviously the temple of god jesus christ said go back read in daniel and whoso understandeth he admonishes them to understand and then he instructs those in matthew 24 that when they observe that event which is basically the antichrist getting in the temple and stopping the daily sacrifice when they observe that event they are to if they are in judah flee into the mountains and these things you read about in matthew mark luke and john when you understand that come alive they're to forsake their families they're to forsake their children they're to forsake all those that are not willing to go and follow jesus christ they are to leave all their possessions they are to leave their homes they're not to go in and get clothing from their homes they are not to turn back like lot's wife did and was turned into a pillar of salt no he warns them it's going to hit fast and it will be the worst time in the history of the world and they are to take action what he's referring to though in daniel should be of interest in us to us because he's referring to the last week on israel's time clock the last week before what before the end comes of the world as we know it as you were as is referred to in matthew 24 as we read in daniel 12 concerning the things in daniel 9 what does that mean well the end of the world as we know it is when god himself is going to return to the world and set up his glorious kingdom from jerusalem and he's going to do that at the end of the 70 at the end of the 70 weeks written about in daniel that we read about in daniel 9 70 weeks were accounted unto israel and unto jerusalem to accomplish many things including an end of sins and everlasting righteousness the lord returns and sets up the kingdom in israel the great day of the lord will finally be there and at the end of the seven years he will destroy all the evil armies and systems of government on this earth he will annihilate all of them he will set up a righteous kingdom the earth will not have war the earth will have peace the earth will have righteousness and the enemy will be bound in hell where he belongs the evil people who are called the children of the wicked one will be eliminated from the earth so satan his fallen angels and all the people that whether they like it or not whether they think so or not are actually following the course of satan children of the wicked one he has his children like god has his children which are human beings some of them are with god here on the earth today they've been saved and they've been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son well it'll be the same way in the tribulation some will be with god some will be with satan and they're going to be children of satan they're going to be human beings who actually are, are on satan's side and we read about last week in revelations everyone not written in the book of life is going to be taking the mark of the beast or worshiping his image or bowing down to him or in some way making him making themselves subservient to the antichrist and to satan they're going to worship the dragon they're going to worship the beast all of those not written in the book of life well all those evil people which includes Jews and Gentiles, which includes all kindreds, nations, and tongues. We read about last week in Revelations. All kindreds, all types of people, all nations of people, all tongues or languages. They're not gibberish. 
Don't let anybody fool you. They're not somebody speaking a bunch of gibberish. They are real languages. Tongues are languages. All languages around the world, all nations of people are going to worship the Antichrist and worship Satan, whose names are not written in the book of life. And we write about that in the book of Revelations. But this time period in Daniel, we read, is 70 weeks. The best way to think about it, it might have been confusing to some of you because a week, 70 weeks, well, we saw it's interpreted in Daniel 12, and we see it again in Revelations, that a week is approximately seven years. So the way to think about it is the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 are 70 seven-year periods. 70 seven-year periods, because one week represents seven years. So of those on, on Israel's time clock, and in effect, the time clock for the world and the end of the world as, as we know it, 69 of the weeks have been accomplished. When Jesus, because in Daniel 9, the focus of Daniel 9 is it predicts when Jesus Christ will come, the Messiah will come, on the Messiah, the Prince, and when Jesus Christ will die. We studied that. But it also indicates the number of seven-year periods until the end of the world as we know it. And it indicates that in the middle of the week, the abomination, the last week, the 70th week, the abomination which maketh desolate is going to get in the holy place, which is the Antichrist, getting the holy place and stopping the daily sacrifice. So the last seven-year period has not been fulfilled. How do we know that? Because none of the things of the seven-year period of the Great Tribulation have occurred yet. There is no Jewish temple. It will be there and it will be the holy place in the last seven years on Israel's time clock. Jesus Christ has not returned. So we know that seven years has not been accomplished because at the end of the seven years, the deliverer roars out of Zion and turns away ungodliness from Jacob. The Lord Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, destroys the wicked, and sets up his righteous kingdom from Jerusalem. And the world will be transformed into the best place you could ever imagine. None of that has happened. There will be no war at that time. As we read in the book of Isaiah, that hasn't happened. So none of the things have happened. Of the last seven years on Israel's time clock. So the question arises, if 69 of those years have already uh, happened, 483 years have already occurred from when Daniel uttered the prophecy of a certain event that was going to occur. 483 years of it has occurred all the way through the Messiah coming, Jesus Christ coming to this earth. There's only seven years left. Why did those seven years not occur when Jesus Christ came here, died for sins, and was raised from the dead? Why didn't the seven years occur then? The, the apostles were wondering that. Those who had been instructed by him for three and a half years, supposedly. It's hard to line up those years. So people say three and a half years with certainty. I believe it's three years, maybe more than three years. Nobody is quite sure. But when they had been taught by him, and they probably were taught by him about the book of Daniel. Oh, obviously they were. We read about it in Matthew 24. He was instructing them to go back and read Daniel. What was it they were going to ask him? Or if, put it this way. You have a last chance. You know Jesus Christ is ascending into heaven. He has taught you for three years. You're one of the 12 apostles. You have a last chance to ask him questions. And there you are. He has taught you for 40 days after his resurrection. You go to Acts chapter 1 and see, when they have a last chance to ask him questions, what question did they ask him? It makes perfect sense if you wonder, when is this seven years going to be accomplished? When are you going to establish the kingdom in Israel after the seven years are over? You go to Acts chapter 1. 
and look at verse 4. Actually, why don't you just forward, go forward to verse 6. Here's your last chance. Ask him a question. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What a great question. We have seven years left. You came, okay. 69 weeks are accomplished. You die already. 69 weeks are accomplished of the 70th week, 70 weeks that are that are the time when after those 70 weeks are after those 70 seven year periods, there's only seven left, God. So are you gonna now establish everlasting righteousness with your kingdom in Israel and rule the world from Israel and eliminate all these evil people and get rid of all these satanic people from this earth? Are you gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? We all probably would want to ask him that question. Is it happening now? And he tells them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his power. Very interesting. He doesn't tell them yes. He doesn't tell them no. But he tells them it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Now we know from that day forward, seven years later, he didn't return. We know from that at even 40 years later, uh, 40 years later, he didn't return. What happened to their temple? Their temple's key to the seven year period of the Great Tribulation. What happened to their temple? In AD 70, Titus and a Roman army came in there and besieged Jerusalem and destroyed, he predicted Jesus Christ, not one of those stones would be left on top of the other in Matthew 24 of the temple. When Titus and the Roman army fought against the Jews and the Jews fought heroically, you can read about it in Josephus, Flavius, Josephus who was a Jewish historian wrote about it. The Jews fought heroically and, and very well against the Romans. And they resisted the Romans. It was not an easy battle for the Romans. But when the Romans got in there in AD 70 and finally took it over and burned it out and it was absolute carnage around Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in the temple, they cleared all the trees within a 20 mile radius. They made what used to look like beautiful gardens look like a horrible landscape. They raised so much of the city and they finally took every stone of the temple down and they went berserk in there. You can read about what they did. But the temple was gone. So the seven years could not be accomplished. What happened to it? There's only one answer, and there's one clear answer in the Word of God. The dispensation of the grace of God was going to be brought in by the Almighty Himself. The dispensation of the grace of God is the only answer in the scriptures on why the seven years did not occur, why Jesus Christ didn't come back. And they thought he would and establish the kingdom. He had a mystery time that has gone on for over 1,900 years that the Bible indicates was given to the Apostle Paul. During this mystery time, Israel is fallen, not risen, as we read in Romans 11, as taught by Steve, um, that we're not to be ignorant of this mystery lest we be wise in our own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there's a mystery time where Israel is blinded, but it's not just Israel being blinded in part, it's God saving people by grace through faith without works, religion, or the Old Testament law. It's the mystery of the dispensation of the grace of God, that a Jew can get saved by mercy, that a Gentile could get saved by mercy, in spite of the temple being destroyed. And by the way, when Titus destroyed the temple and when they destroyed Jerusalem, and some accounts by Josephus were that a million people were killed. It was not a small battle, that over a million people perished. The Romans would just slaughter everybody, pretty much other than those they take in as slaves, 
They kill the old, they kill the combatants. They would distribute combatants around their empire to be killed and slaughtered ritualistically in different temples. And then they would keep young ones as slaves that they would sell off or keep for themselves. But of those that were killed, Josephus indicated over a million. But that, see, and by the way, Titus thought that God delivered Jerusalem into his hands. He said, that he would not take the accolades for that defeat because he saw that God delivered Jerusalem into his hands. That's what Titus said. Now, he, not that he's an authority on anything. He was not a Caesar at the time. Later on, he became a Caesar. But the only explanation and the explanation, and then if you don't understand what God is doing in that, you're gonna wonder why did why was that, why is the 70th week? Why is that still lingering out there? Why is there only seven years left for Israel? Because God decided to save people by mercy. He wanted to have a time of mercy. He wanted to have a time of long suffering. He wanted to have a time where he would save Jew and Gentile without works. That's why he decided to have this time of the dispensation of the grace of God. And we looked at it in Ephesians 3 last time. Why don't we turn to Ephesians 3 verse 1. That's why it's called a mystery. In those in the book of Daniel, did we read anything about a time of God's grace? No, we didn't. In the book of Matthew, did we read anything about a time of God's grace? No, we didn't. We read about the great tribulation and the worst time in the history of the world. The same thing we read about in the book of Daniel. There'll be a time that wasn't like any other time since there was a nation. We didn't read a word about the dispensation of the grace of God. When we read Peter's writings, that God speaking through Peter. Did we read anything about the dispensation of the grace of God and the mystery of it? No, we do not read anything about that anywhere in there. Is it found in what was revealed to John in the book of Revelations? No, it is not found anywhere in what was revealed to John in the book of Revelations. Neither do you read about it in any Hebrew epistles, such as Hebrews, James, and so forth. Now, Peter alludes to the long suffering of God spoken of by Paul. But he says that there are things in there that are difficult to understand because it wasn't revealed to Peter. It was revealed to Paul. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you were. Remember, in Romans 11, how last uh, Tuesday we studied that and what is it that must come in before uh, the blindness in part is taken away from Israel? The fullness of the Gentiles must be come in. Along with the fullness of the Gentiles, by the way, are Jews getting saved by mercy, just like we get saved. There's no distinction in the body of Christ. It's a completion of the body of Christ, which is associated with Gentiles, but there's Jew and Gentile alike in there, no distinction. Remember, it's a gospel of the uncircumcision, that is part of the body of Christ. It puts people in the body of Christ. So it's associated with Gentiles. A mercy time that God would have mercy on everyone, including the Gentiles and the Jews. If you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God, verse 2, which is given me to your word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote a foreign few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Peter, James, and John, and none of those men knew it in Acts. He said, you're going to establish the kingdom in Israel. He didn't tell them about the mystery of the dispensation of the grace of God right there in Acts chapter 1. Told them it wasn't for them to know the times. He didn't tell them about it. They didn't know about it. Had they known about it, they would say, oh, of course. We have the dispensation of the grace of God to go through now. How many of these weeks of years are in the dispensation of the grace of God? You can count them up yourself. It's over 1,990 uh, years. So it's what, over 250 of these, of these weeks of years? Not one single one of them was the 70th week of Daniel. I know it seems complex. If you, those of you that are following me, could, those that find a hard time to understand this, I understand it is complicated, but you can look back at the previous two sessions on. Uh, video on the recordings on the website to see, you know, if you if you haven't been caught up with where we are now. So 
this is the mystery that was not revealed. And therefore, for example, when Peter was preaching in Acts 319, he was revealed, he was talking about things. God was revealing through Peter things that were were predicted by all the holy prophets since the world began. That God spoke through the mouth of these prophets and predicted the things concerning what Peter and those were going through in early Acts. And it's in relation to the Great Tribulation, but it wasn't part of the Great Tribulation. They didn't know that. They didn't understand that. They probably knew it wasn't happening right then and there. Yes, I don't mean they didn't know it was part of the Great Tribulation, but they didn't know what the about the dispensation of grace until it was revealed to Paul in verse this mystery in verse four, whereby when you read you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the dispensation of the grace of God. Verse three was given by revelation to Paul. In verse five, it was not in other ages made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, and that was through Paul, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And Paul was made a minister of that gospel in verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And that gift of grace is the same way you get saved. You get saved by the gift of the grace of God that you receive by faith. If you wonder about that gift, then read the book of Romans, read Romans chapter five, count how many times it's called a gift there in Romans five, and then read Romans six, where the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what this man was a minister of, this gift of the grace of God, the salvational gift of the grace of God. Notice in verse 8 we read that, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So you can't search it out in the Old Testament scriptures. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. See who this grace was given to Paul. The unsearchable riches of Christ. This grace was given to Paul. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Which from the beginning of the world had been hidden God. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now. And remember it's the now period onto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the church of body of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God. It's the but now period that we read about in Ephesians uh, chapter two. Why don't we turn back to Ephesians chapter two and let's, let's go to, uh, uh, to verse, let's start in verse um, 11. And this is review, but this is so important that these are things we should read over and over again. Ephesians 2, verse 11, wherefore remember that ye being in time past, so that Ephesians 2 is broken up into time past, now, but now, and the ages to come. So re wherefore remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision and the flesh made by hands, that at that time when time passed, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, just like we read in Ephesians 3, but now in Christ Jesus, Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. It's the but now period. That is before the 70th week of Daniel. It's a dispensation of the grace of God that explains why Israel's seven week hasn't happened. Uh, 70th week, their last seven weeks hasn't happened. And why Christ is not sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, ruling the world right now in righteousness. 
it's this time God wanted to save people by grace, by the gift of grace, and by his blood, in verse 13, we are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Let's take a look at another one of these periods that we read about last week. Um, and actually, I want to go back for a second. I want to look at something uh, that we read about in the book of Acts. So turn to Acts 3. So this was something that was hidden and was not revealed um, since the, the world began, this mystery time we're living in. That's why they didn't know about it. But if you turn back to Acts chapter uh, 3 and go to, uh, start in verse 18, Acts chapter 3, verse 18. In verse 18, it says, But those things which God before has shewed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. It was not a mystery Christ would die for sins. It is not a mystery that Christ would be raised. It is not a mystery that people would be resurrected from the dead, that Christ would give people righteousness and eternal life. It was not a mystery that there would be a resurrection from the dead and the gathering of the elect and the gathering to Israel, none of those things are a mystery. Not a mystery there be a kingdom that God would establish on the earth. No, none of those things are a mystery. But in verse 19, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, until the times of restitution of all things that is when god establishes his kingdom he restores all things the restitution of all things which god has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began notice how it's god speaking through the mouth of these prophets it's not these prophets making anything up it's not the prophets that decided oh i'm gonna I'm going to sit and meditate and come up with a revelation from God. I'm going to sit in church and announce a revelation from God. It's God speaking through the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. What is that? What has he spoken by the mouth of all his pro holy prophets since the world began? The, about the times of restitution of all things. Well, when you compare that with what Paul is preaching, and what Paul was preaching, what God was speaking through Paul's mouth, was something hidden from, for ages in time past. It was not revealed as it is now revealed. So what was hidden in time past, it was never revealed, is completely different from this, which was revealed by, that God spoke by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He had been speaking about these things. You just have to read the Old Testament prophets and you could find out about these things. But there is nothing in the Old Testament prophets that we see about a dispensation of grace, that there'd be a, a thousand nine hundred over 250 or 220 of these weeks of, of seven years where there would be a time of grace. Where God would save by grace through faith without works. That is not, I've never seen that in the Old Testament prophets. I don't see it anywhere but in the in the epistles of Paul. That's the explanation that God gives the whole world, the universe, and the angels. It's also to the heaven angels in heavenly places. We read about that. It's being made known unto them finally this mystery through the church. You're a part of in what Paul was preaching, part of this mystery that's revealed to angels too. They wondered about it. Why don't we turn to uh, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And let's start in verse 25. So you see the difference. Something spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. 
compared to something that has been kept secret since the world began. Difference, right? Spoken by all the holy prophets since the world began, mouth of all his holy prophets, and kept secret since the world began, completely different. That's why this mystery time you're living in is so special. And you got to understand it to understand what God is doing today. Why he's not pouring his wrath on people. Why is he not destroying the world for all their evil and wickedness, which he will do one day. That's the answer, the dispensation of the grace of God, the mystery. So Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is a power to establish, establish you according to my gospel. Paul refers it to, it, to it as my gospel in Romans chapter 2, also in the Timothys. According to my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. There it is again, this mystery, the revealing of the mystery. That was revealed to Paul. The, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Here's another one of these but nows. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting god made known to all nations for the obedience of faith now that seems contradictory because it seems to say that oh the mystery is revealed by the scriptures of the prophets but let me tell you what it is see it wasn't a mystery that god would bless the gentiles that is in old testament prophecy that God would be a light unto the Gentiles, that the Gentiles return to God, that Israel would be used to bring the Gentiles in. None of that's a mystery. What was a mystery that through the fall of Israel, salvation would come to the Gentiles and Romans 11 is a mystery. And the thing about the prophecies that we never should forget is when Paul mentioned, when God mentions through Paul here, now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. The gospel that Paul preached was according to prophecy in that it states in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Yes, Isaiah 53 has Christ dying for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Yes that God's body would never decompose, and yes, that he'd be begotten from the dead, is an Old Testament scripture that his holy one would not suffer corruption. You're, the gospel that we're saved by is according to the scriptures. It said so in 1 Corinthians 15. So people could look back in the scriptures and see, ah, there is foretold that Christ has died for our sins. But the fact that in spite of the fall of Israel, salvation would come by grace, through faith, without works, without the Mosaic law, and without Israel being prominent, is a mystery. That is a mystery. Now, the fall of Israel is not a mystery in that he would he would actually create a people that are low am I, that are not my people. That's an Old Testament scripture. A lot about that is an Old Testament scripture. But those facts that I laid out are not an Old Testament scripture that through their fall, this salvation would come out of the Gentiles through a gospel that is by grace through faith without any works. You know, you, you can't, you can see an element of that, of salvation without works and that David prophecy of those that God would, would um, not impute sin to. Yes, there's that kind of thing in there, but that combination of things, the mystery of the time we're living in, and that there'd be this mystery time. No, you can't see that in there anywhere that I'm aware of. You see the seven years in the great tribulation, you see the, um, the kingdom of God, and you see these, all these other things that are occur in the future time. But as far as this time we're living in, no, I don't think it's found there anywhere. It's a mystery that was hidden until it was revealed to Paul. Let's take a look at another one of these but nows. So we saw several of these but nows. Why don't we turn to Colossians uh, chapter one? See if you see a mystery. See if you see anything committed to Paul. See if you see anything about disp dispensations in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 25. Let's see if I, we identify those key terms and concepts. 
in verse 25 of Colossians 1, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, there it is again, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, there's a mystery, there's a dispensation of God, there's a mystery, mystery, the dispensation of God, which was committed to Paul, given to Paul, uh, right here is given to me, so it wasn't, doesn't say it was given to Peter, James, John, and, uh, and Matthew, or anyone else. He's not being an egomaniac. He is saying the truth of God Almighty. God is speaking through him, showing you this dispensation of God was given to Paul for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, which have been hid. There it is again, the mystery, the same thing we were reading about in Romans, the same thing we read about in Ephesians. Hid from ages, same thing we read about in Romans, same thing we read about in Ephesians, and from generations. But now, aha, uh -huh, there's the same words. Here's our but now. This is why we're not in the 70th week of Daniel. We are in the mystery time that was hidden, the dispensation of grace. But now is made manifest <clears throat> to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And this perfection is the righteousness of Christ, the blood of Christ applied to them, the perfection of the finished work of the cross applied to them, the gospel, the grace of God applied to them. Look back at Romans chapter 3, and we'll see another one of these but nows. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse one of my favorite passages, verse 21. But I don't want to start in verse 21. Let's always start back uh, in uh, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Here it comes, get ready for it. But now, same terminology, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. There you go. You have this gospel where it's unto all and it's upon all them that believe. That's all they do is believe and they get God's righteousness. But you go back to verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. How is that righteousness of God witnessed by the law and the prophets? Because it was predicted that Christ would be their righteousness. That Christ would be the righteousness of people is in the Old Testament scriptures. You can read about it, that Christ would be their righteousness. Now, the law was to be their righteousness as well, but it's back in Old Testament prophecy about the righteousness of God. It's in there. But here you have it, so that it's upon all, unto all, and upon all that believe. Let's go to another one, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Be aware when you read this passage that Christ appeared. To Paul. There was an appearing of Christ to Paul. So when you see the appearing of Christ, it doesn't mean just when he walked the earth. No, he appeared to Paul, and the scripture uses that language. Second Timothy chapter 1. Let's look at verse 9. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9.
who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. That's when our connection with Jesus Christ started, with God, our so-called religion, as people like to call it. It's not really a religion, but our, our church, the body of Christ, began, in a sense, before the world began, because that's when Christ gave us this salvation by grace through faith before the world began. That's when he promised us eternal life before the world began. And that's where he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and without blame before him in love, before the world began. That connection started before the world began. So people like to say, well, when did your religion start? I will tell them it started before the world ever began. God promised it. Getting back to here, though, who had saved us and called us? within holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for another one of these? But is now, there it is, but is now made manifest. There you go, another one of the but nows. But is now, what is made manifest? This salvation without any works. Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. When was it made manifest, but is now made manifest? Well, those but nows are associated with Paul, but is this one associated with Paul? I would say absolutely it is. And I'll show you why. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who have abolished death and have brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Well, first of all, when was this appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ? That's one question. Who have abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Which gospel is that? Is that the gospel that Peter preached in Acts 2, 38, that you're to repent and be baptized? And your sins are blotted out at the second coming of Christ in Acts 3.19. Would that be that gospel? Or the one where you have to endure on to the end to be saved in Matthew chapter 24 or keep the commandments in Matthew 19? No, no. This is the one that was given to Paul. This is the one that was, Paul was appointed the preacher and apostle and teacher of the Gentiles for. If you read on, you see, and have brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Well, which one? Well. Paul was given his gospel by revelation of Jesus Christ in Galatians, and he had to reveal it. God revealed it through Paul to Peter, James, and John in Galatians 2. Gave it to Paul, Galatians 1, revealed it to, through Paul in Galatians 2. So no, that gospel was not given to Peter, James, and John. It was given to Paul, and he had to reveal it to them. So there's the abolition of death and this bringing of life and immortality and it goes to light, it's, it's explained, it's illuminated, it is understood through the gospel of grace. That's what the gospel is. Whereunto Paul, I, that's Paul, am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Now, why do I say this is when he appeared to Paul? Why do I say that is manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ? Because that the scripture says that he appeared to Paul and he was given that gospel uh, by revelation of Jesus Christ. And he's talking about this gospel that he was given uh, where it's salvation by grace through faith without words. So it'd be without the water baptism. Peter's preaching in Acts 2.38 without the water baptism that the 12 are sent to do in places such as Matthew 28 and Mark 16. It's without the enduring on to the end to be saved, and the similar doctrines we read about in Hebrews 3, 6, and 10, and being faithful unto death in the book of Revelations, it's without those things, that distinctive gospel was given to Paul. But let's look at where the Bible says that Jesus appeared to Paul. Let's go to Acts chapter 26. 
Turn to Acts chapter 26. I keep on forgetting I have the Bible on the screen. I'm turning in my Bible and so used to doing it. So in Acts chapter 26, and turn down, I have to find this passage. I know it's in here though. I'm confident. Go down further in Acts 26, and let's look at verse 16. So Jesus Christ appeared unto him, and when he, he Paul is recounting this. Well, go back to verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. This is the road to Damascus. Jesus Christ is appearing unto him. But let's look for that word. Does it, does it, is it defined that way by the scriptures? Because we read in 2 Timothy that, um, that it's the appearing of Jesus Christ when he abolished death and all those other things through the gospel. Well, what does it say here? And Paul says, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Persecutest, for arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. So he appeared unto him there. That's why I believe the appearing associated with Paul's gospel and salvation by grace through faith in Second Timothy chapter one is this appearing. He appeared unto him there, and then he said unto thee, I have, I have appeared unto these for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Unto thee. So he was going to appear unto him in future things. He, there would be further appearings of Jesus Christ unto him. We know Paul was actually caught up into the third heaven and he saw things up in heaven and jesus christ revealed things to him that it was not lawful for him to speak about back there he couldn't tell whether he was in his body or out of his body taken up into the third heaven and you'll see that jesus christ also at other times appeared unto him and spoke to him so that's why i think that second timothy one is that reference to appearing i think i'm going to pretty much um, end it for tonight, I want to say just one other thing. You're going to see that nowhere does Paul instruct you, and I, I got into how we don't read about the dispensation of the grace of God in Old Testament prophecy. We don't read about it in Matthew through John. We don't read about it. It's not really explained in the book of Acts. That's why the book of Acts is not a place to take anybody to learn any doctrine, really. There's some doctrinal things you can learn in there. Yes, you can see some things, and you can see some things as I just took you to the book of Acts where there's certain things. But I would not, I would not go to the book of Acts to teach people how to get saved. I wouldn't say I'd go to the book of Acts, start reading there. They would think they'd have to sell all their possessions and follow Jesus. They would think they need to keep the law and be in the like the early uh, church in Jerusalem was doing, and that they would need to do those other things. So I wouldn't take them there. Uh, to uh, for an example, but I just want to say this: you don't read about the dispensation of the grace of God in Matthew through John in the Old Testament and in the Book of Acts. You read about it distinctly, the dispensation given to Paul in places like Ephesians and Colossians and First Corinthians. You read about the distinctiveness of the message given to him in places like Titus and First and Second Timothy. But at the same time, you do not read in the epistles of Paul about how you're to survive the seven years of great tribulation. You're not told you need to flee into the mountains. You're not told to look for those things in the sense that they're told to look for those things in Matthew 24. Paul has references to the tr tribulation in such places as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But he always distinguishes those saved people that are in the church, which is the body of Christ, from those that suffer the wrath in the tribulation. People will say that's because, oh, believers don't suffer the wrath in the tribulation. Well, that's not true. Believers in the tribulation that take the mark of the beast suffer the torment of God. They are not saved unless they endure unto the end. Believers that aren't doing the things that God tells them to do, according to Matthew 24, they are cut in half. 
and they suffer the wrath of God when he returns because they're not doing the things he tells them to do. So there's we there's wailing and gnashing of teeth, and they suffer the wrath of an unbeliever. But Paul distinguishes us. We are those that were not appointed under wrath. We are those that received salvation and everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. He always takes us out of the picture of the tribulation. In, in places like um, in the Thessalonians where you have a reference to the second coming of Christ, Paul says, to you who are troubled, rest with us. And he explains why we're there admiring the Lord because his testimony among us was believed. He always takes us out of the way and he gives thanks to God for us that he has not chosen us to wrath, but to receive salvation. So that's an, a very important thing to know that you're not given instruction on how to deal with the tribulation because he's taking you out of that picture of the tribulation. You're of the day and not of the night. And what is the ex explanation for that? He beseeches you by it in 2 Thessalonians, the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him. That's the explanation for it, the rapture of the church. We're going to be taken out before. But as I said last time, even if we're wrong about a preacher of rapture, none of these other facts about how we're saved by grace through faith, and we're not going to be part of that the tribulation, we're not going to be part of that mark of the beast stuff or any of that stuff, it doesn't fail. If we're wrong about when the rapture, the rapture is not a house of cards. If there's no pre-trib rapture, it all falls apart. No, every single verse about our salvation doesn't change. Every single thing about the dispensation of the grace of God doesn't change. People want to make it a house of cards because they don't want the doctrine of the dispensation of grace and, and dispensational doctrine to apply. So they try to act like, oh, you believe in the pre-trib rapture. That's not a currency. You're going in the tribulation. You're wrong about it all this stuff about once saved, always saved. Well, that isn't true. They're trying to disregard vast tracts of the epistles of Paul and say, that's not true what you're saying, God. They're, they're really arguing with God. There comes a point in time when you get established in the basics of rightly dividing the word of truth that you're going to realize some people want to argue with God. It's not your place to take God's place in argument. They won't, if you show them the scriptures, they won't believe it. They'll try to argue over it. And then you'll realize there's somebody there that's trying to argue with God. Be charitable to them, but there comes a time when you have to close a book and maybe put your efforts somewhere else towards somebody that's more willing to receive the truth. And most people are not, in my experience, in 30 years of sharing this with people, I found, found most Christians are not very in, that interested in it. They have their church. You start talking to them outside of their church and wonder what you're doing. They're already a Christian. They claim, so why are you talking about this doctrine? A lot of them have no interest, don't have a lot of interest in it. So when you see that when, when you present this to people and somebody wants to argue over it, and when you show them the, the scriptures, you think, what else can I do? What else can I do? Well, why don't you just let our God, I mean, let God argue for himself. You've pointed to the scriptures of God. They have a choice. God gave them free choice. They can believe it or not believe it. Well, anyway, I'm going to end there.